Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Food and Beverage Industry Trends 2019. The webinar is presented by Restaurant Business, Food Service Director, Technomic, and Nestle Professionals. I'm Pat Kobe, Editor at Restaurant Business, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Throughout our presentation, we encourage you to interact with our speakers by typing in questions using the Q&A widget on your screen. We will answer questions live at the end of the presentation. You can also customize your window by moving and resizing the panel. If you are experiencing any technical issues, please use the help button at the bottom right of your screen. Please note that you may need to enable flash on your computer in order to optimize the webinar audio and slide deck. If you'd like to join the conversation on Twitter, today's hashtag is Food Service 2019. We are also recording today's session, and we will email you as soon as the recording is available. I'll now turn the webinar over to Amy Harvey, Managing Editor at Technomic, who will be kicking off today's presentation. Take it away, Amy. Thank you so much, Pat. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to what we hope is an engaging and informative session on the top food and beverage industry trends for 2019. Today, Nestle has partnered with Technomic to research and curate the next forward-looking food and drink trends for this year and beyond. Today, we're excited to explore what's new, now, and next in the world of food service across multiple channels, and we hope you'll join our discussion by tweeting about our trends using that hashtag, FoodService2019. So to get things started, we'll start with a few introductions. My name is Amy Harvey, and I'm Managing Editor for Technomic, and in my 16 years with the firm, I've been involved in trend analysis across menu, consumer, and concept sectors. And joining me today are Chef Ryan Baxter. He is the Director of National Account Chefs at Nestle Professional. He is a certified hospitality educator and a member of the ACS. His professional experience ranges from leading food service initiatives at Kraft, Cargill, and also to being executive chef at Chubb and Sun World Headquarters and senior chef at Ingersoll Rand, both for Sodexo Management. He's an award-winning chef who's a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, where he was also the associate professor training students in culinary fundamentals. Chef Ryan has provided culinary training on site to Navy mess specialists at the White House in Washington, D.C. We are also pleased to welcome Martin Lyons. He's Vice President of Beverage Marketing for Nestle Professional USA and has worked in the OOH industry for over 25 years. He has held various senior sales and marketing roles with international companies, including Foster's, which is now part of InBev, and Jose Cuervo Diageo. And Martin has worked in both local and global marketing positions within Nestle for the past 12 years. He's an English national with an honors degree in business and French, and currently he is responsible for the strategic development of a broad range of beverage categories, including coffee, creamers, and a range of non-carbonated cold beverages. So we are excited that Chef Ryan and Martin are here to help all of us understand what's behind these trends and what we can all anticipate down the road. So we're looking forward to hearing their expert insights throughout our presentation today. Well, we said at the beginning that this would be an interactive session, so here's where you all come in. We'd like for you to weigh in and offer your opinion. So here's a poll question for you. In your view, what do you think is the most popular food and beverage trend in the food service industry today? Is it the demand for international flavors and ingredients? How about progression toward plant-based uh, ingredient alternatives? Excuse me. Is it healthier vegetable-centric offerings or texture-rich items like crunchy options that also offer high flavor? Is it the rise of comfort food? Or is it about those digital innovations that simplify consumer online ordering? We'll give you a minute here to think about these food and beverage trends. Select one and go ahead and hit submit. 
And while you look these over, just understand that this will provide a blueprint and a framework uh, for the trends that we're going to be discussing today. And if you're using social media and would like to continue talking about what we've identified as the top trends, remember to use that hashtag, Food Service 2019. So we'll give you just a minute to consider, is it ethnic foods and flavors, plant-based ingredients, vegetables, texture-rich items, comfort food, or digital innovation? So we'll go ahead and see if we have uh, some results here for anyone who participated. Wow, and it looks like you're really interested in those plant-based ingredient alternatives, and you've pinpointed that as your most popular food and beverage trend in the industry today. Well, that's great, and we're in just a few minutes, we're going to delve uh, more into that particular topic. So with that being said, let's get into our first major trend. And it's fitting that we explore this topic around health and wellness, as most people's thoughts typically turn to eating healthy at the beginning of each year, right? But our first trend asks the question, what is healthy today? It appears that consumers are making up their own minds around health, and menu trends are steadily pointing in new directions in response to what healthy means today. In fact, in 2018, Technomic asked 100 restaurant consumers about the ways in which they're defining or redefining health when we did our 2018 Healthy Eating Consumer Trend Report. And 40% indicated that just within the last two years, they've changed their definition about what healthy means to them. Now, low calorie, low fat, low salt, low sugar, that will always sort of be the baseline for how many mainstream consumers identify health. But the sensibility is starting to evolve. The mindset is starting to evolve. There's lots of information out there about food ingredients, and consumers are saying that they can decide for themselves what healthy means to them. And in fact, in just within the last two years, 40% have said that they've changed their definitions around what health means. So where do we stand along this timeline in the evolution of health? Well, when we talk about eating healthy, just strictly from a weight management or weight loss standpoint, that was kind of where we've traditionally stood. But we've moved away from merely looking at healthy eating as a way to lose weight or maintain weight. Instead, we're more connected to this idea of clean eating. What does clean eating mean? Well, it means free of artificial ingredients, perhaps, or artificial flavors, free of antibiotics, free of hormones and preservatives, and more transparency in general. So transparency in terms of where and when and how food ingredients are sourced and when the food was prepared. So that's become a big, uh, you know, a central idea in the mind of consumers about food that is better for me. If I can identify when, where, and how the food was prepared, I get a better idea of what I'm putting into my body, and that fits into my idea of health. So where are we poised to go next? Well, um, you know, there's a progression around natural remedies, um, natural enhancements, um, so doing things that are good for the body, providing all natural functional benefits, really pointing to those ingredients that enhance your life and your sense of well-being. So ingredients that increase energy or alertness, ingredients that help you strengthen your memory or even help you sleep or help you relax. Food as function is the new healthy. And consumer data on this topic really helps bear this out, and in a very real way, in terms of actually driving menu purchases and what consumers are actually willing to buy and even pay more for. So 500 consumers that we surveyed for this Healthy Eating Trend Report told Technomic that functional attributes can influence purchases, even if it comes at an increased cost. So about a third of consumers are willing to pay more for foods that are high in antioxidants and foods that carry just other functional benefits. Roughly 25% of consumers also say that they'll pay more for menu items that help them digest their food or menu items that have anti-inflammatory ingredients. 
and another fifth are willing to pay more for ingredients that help them relieve stress and contain probiotics as well. So this is really where we start to see the payoff, uh, you know, and the benefit of offering these sorts of ingredients on the menu. And not just in food, but also in beverages. So here's a look at some of the fast-growing ingredients that are now carving out that wider niche on the menu. Now, this data comes from Technomics Ignite uh, trend tracking resource. This is menu data that is looking at year over year. And we tracked growth of these ingredients over the last year, and we found some pretty uh, significant increases in menu incidence, so menu mentions of these functional ingredients in the glass, in beverages, as well as on the plate. So we'll start with cannabis. Uh, cannabis has revealed a 9% jump in menu listings within the last year. And of course, there are different legal parameters in different states. We want to be clear about that um, regarding the use of THC, which is the active ingredient in cannabis. Um, but this, for example, at Narc Bar in New York City, the matcha haze cocktail makes use of CBD. And CBD is the non-active uh, oil derived from cannabis. So it doesn't give you that feeling of being high that people, um, you know, associate with marijuana. But the CBD oil um, is said to have uh, pain-relieving uh, properties, so said to relieve pain and reduce inflammation. Uh, at Narc Bar in New York City, so they lace this um, this cocktail with the CBD oil. So again, um, you know, putting that anti-inflammatory functional ingredient into a cocktail. We've also seen growth of turmeric. It's another ingredient that's known for its anti-inflammatory uh, properties. It's up more than 4% year over year. And here we see it in a very colorful presentation in a mango cocktail at the Wild Sun in New York City. And finally, we have goldenberry. This is another on-trend ingredient that's truly spiked in its number of menu mentions, revealing 100% growth in menu incidence year over year. The, uh, goldenberry is an antioxidant-rich berry packed with protein, promotes cardiovascular health, and here it is in a presentation in a dessert. So the next interpretation of this trend points to plants, and this was the top food and beverage trend, according to all of you. Um, so it, it really is very impactful on our industry. So the next trend is all about plants and how plant-based alternatives are truly being presented in interesting and, more importantly, really flavorful and creative ways. So we know that soy-based or gluten-based imitation beef and pork, that's been around for quite a while. But now we're seeing plant-based ingredients that mimic other ingredients like seafood and even eggs. So, for example, um, on, in the college and university sector, the dining services department at Indiana University uh, recently provided some samples and, and developed uh, crabless crab cakes. And the so-called crab in this dish is actually a unique mix of corn and hearts of palm to mimic um, the, the, the mouthfeel of crab and the flavor of crab. Uh, Plant-based meats like this are up by 62.5% since last year alone. The Gray Canary in Memphis, Tennessee, offers its Mount Crumpet cocktail, a very colorful cocktail, but that's not egg white that it's topped with. It's aquafaba, and aquafaba is whipped chickpea, and it's an ingredient that is appearing in cocktails more than ever. We've seen a 75% jump on menus since 2017. And finally, it looks like pulled pork, but it's actually jackfruit. Um, and jackfruit is a lot like tofu in that it takes on the flavor of whatever it's cooked with. And according to Technomics Ignite menu data, jackfruit is up about 42% uh, year over year. So Yato's in Bidford, Maine, offers the jack, which is shredded jackfruit tossed in barbecue sauce. And it's very similar in taste and texture to pulled pork. So truly creative, vegan-friendly, plant-based preparations. They are on the rise, they're not going anywhere, and they are really helping to redefine what healthy means today. So this looks like a good place to, for uh, Chef Ryan and for Martin to weigh in on the new healthy. So we'll reach out to Chef Ryan first. Um, from a manufacturer's perspective, what are some things to consider when delivering healthy ingredients and products to the food service industry? Amy, thank you for the question. You know, I was thinking as you were presenting uh, about how far we've really come around 
the expectation of consumers, and therefore the responsibility of manufacturers to respond to these changing demands around what, what uh, consumers want is healthy. And I, I think back to a time when I worked uh, for another manufacturer where in the development process we used a, an ingredient that was generally uh, consider, that was considered safe addition for food, and it, it was called titanium dioxide. And um, while that probably doesn't sound like a food ingredient, right, I'm sure to anyone at this point, many years ago it, it was. And it, it ended up turning out to be a whitening ingredient that was used and is still used in the manufacture of paint. So we've come a long way. Consumers have certainly uh, forced us and in, in a really great way to, 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 to do more as manufacturers. So here at Nestle, one of the buzzwords that we hear all the time is something we call clean label, right? And uh, we've been uh, focused on that for quite a long time. Uh, but what does clean label really mean, right? Uh, well, I think there's some general agreement, as you pointed out, that people are looking for things that are simpler, uh, foods that they know. Matter of fact, one of the things that helps to describe that for some consumers is words that they can pronounce, right? We've also sometimes heard it called grandma's pantry, right? Things that might be related to things or found in your grandma's pantry, right? So common things that could be pronounced, right? That's a very nostalgic view, but I think there's a lot of truth to that, right? So operators are asking for these things, but there does seem to be some variation on how it's defined by operators and therefore how it impacts us as manufacturers. What we consider, among other things, when we look at producing healthy foods on the manufacturer level, are, are starts with often a list. Many of our customers have developed lists of what they call acceptable foods. And these lists are either developed internally by the customers or they're, they're borrowed from other organizations. They're sometimes called the no-no list, right? And it really gives manufacturers great clarity on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, right? So once we have that list and we understand what are what are what ultimately consumers and these operators will, will want from that product? We think of things like what that shelf life would be, how long that product might need to be in distribution so it can be delivered uh, fresh and without any quality changes. We consider cost, obviously. Um, so those are really some of those things. Um, again, you talked about sodium reduction, although we're seeing that less and less. It seems like things like use of natural sweeteners, like agave or honey. The incorporation of whole grains and legumes wherever possible in products are critical to the manufacturing process these days. And of course, no artificial colors or preservatives. So it really represents a change from really even a short time ago. The demands are greater, the operators have different expectations, and those are some of the things that we as manufacturers are doing to address that. And I would just say these are great changes that are here to stay. And, and we're happy about that. Awesome. Uh, great response. Martin, do you want to weigh in for just a minute on how the beverage category is responding to these new, this new mindset around health? What kind of trends are you seeing in beverages in terms of health? Sure. Um, obviously, uh, you know, a bit like what's happening in the food area, we're seeing similar things in beverages. Um, I guess from a, from a U.S. beverage perspective, we're seeing an increased influence from, from the Far East, uh, flavors around uh, cardamom, leveraging uh, products like a calamansi, which is very unique to the Philippines, very unusual, gives a very distinct uh, citrus flavor. Uh, but equally, when you come to, you know, the USA is very much a traditional uh, black tea market, sweet and, and unsweet black tea, but the use of chrysanthemum leaves as the base for tea rather than the generic black or green tea leaves, um, and then, you know, in markets like China, where clearly those drivers you mentioned around aiding digestion or uh, anti-inflammatory, the use of products like purple potato as, as a cold beverage, which may sound strange to, to many people, but in China, it's a, it's a huge category. And we're now seeing influences of purple potato based lattes or smoothies entering in, into the U.S. market. So I think we very much follow what's happening on food. Um, increasingly mm -hmm. food beverages are a complement to what people uh, are consuming um, we're seeing a decline in traditional carbonated soft drinks uh, carbonation isn't really the problem 
it's what's in those carbonated drinks. So we're now seeing a lot more around nitrogenated cold brew, carbonated kombuchas, carbonated um, low calorie juices. So I think the trend, you know, aligned to what Chef Ryan was saying is very much around cleaner, healthier, better for me, more transparent. And at the same time, it has to be an experience. I mean, the beverage at the end of the day has to be an experience and it's got to be something that I can't normally get at home, but I can get it um, in out of home. And I think for further information on this, I'd suggest, you know, the audience go to um, our website, metaprofessional.us, where we have uh, the 2019 trend report, which is free and available to download if you want to dig into this a bit further. Yes, that, that trend report that's available by Nestle is just packed with some great insights and a lot of great trends. Thanks for that. So for our next big trend for the year, let's crisscross the globe and delve into the ethnic cuisines that are gaining momentum today. And the main theme for the international cuisine trend that we're going to be talking about is this. We're starting to move away from just that generic uh, ethnic descriptor for food and move more towards specific regional cuisines. So, uh, you know, operators are starting to develop a stronger level of authenticity, and that is really in response to what consumers are looking for. Because you may ask yourself, well, is the consumer ready for that deeper dive into ethnic fare? Well, the stage is already set because well over a third of consumers overall and more than half of younger adult consumers, the ones who really drive those food and beverage trends forward, they say that they order ethnic foods and drinks at least once a week from any type of food service location, from a restaurant, from a retail, um, from any type of non-commercial or commercial food service location, at least once a week, more than a third of them and more than half of younger adult consumers are ordering what they term ethnic foods and drinks. Okay, so that's pretty frequent um, patronage and purchase. Um, and about a quarter say that they're eating more types of unique ethnic foods and drinks, more than they were just two years ago. So the interest is starting to grow over a shorter period of time, um, the interest in unique ethnic foods and drinks. So moving a bit away um, from that Americanized Chinese or Americanized Mexican or Americanized Italian. And yes, those are still the big three uh, when you're thinking about the U.S. market, the big three that are, you know, that have the most pull with the mainstream consumer. But the interest is really starting to bubble up from that younger consumer, um, definitely showing that interest in more uniqueness is on the rise. So as we talk about this interest in a deeper level of immersion into world cuisines, we're really looking toward the Middle East. And in the past, the generic descriptor of Middle Eastern was the typical type of menu listing. And that's fine. That's pretty well entrenched over the last several years. But now we're seeing more interest in specific exploration of the cuisine in different Middle Eastern countries. So according to Technomics most recent ethnic report, there's growing interest in Lebanese and Israeli, Turkish, Persian, Syrian cuisine. So more than half of the consumers surveyed about these specific cuisines said, I haven't necessarily tried this type of food, but I'd like to because it sounds good. So again, the interest is there. If, if These may be uninitiated consumers, but they do have interest. So going beyond just saying, here's Middle Eastern food, well, how about calling out the fact that a certain ingredient is Lebanese or Israeli or Syrian to really pique the interest among the consumer? That's what they're looking for. More than half of them say, I may not have tried it, but I definitely want to give it a try. So to answer this demand for new things to try, 30% of food service operators, now this includes restaurants and non-commercial operators, Okay, so 30% say that over the past two years, they're offering more ethnic dishes or more offerings with ethnic flavors. Now, two-thirds are standing still on the ethnic that they order. They're offering about the same amount, but just 4% are offering fewer ethnic dishes. So the key takeaway here, you know, and if you watch the industry and you watch menu development, you know that over the past couple of years, menu optimization has really been key. Operators have really been downsizing the menu. Everyone is not offering bigger, bloated menus. They're kind of making menus more compact in favor of specialization. So most restaurant chain menus, for example, have been getting smaller. 
but operators, operators have been removing items. But 30% of them say, I'm still adding ethnic dishes. And two-thirds say, I'm keeping the ethnic dishes that I have. So what that signals to us is that these international foods and flavors are here to stay and becoming more of a menu fixture than maybe they were in the past. So what's next in the Middle Eastern realm? So we, we indicated that certain countries in the Middle Eastern regions um, were, you know, piquing the interest of the consumer. We're keeping our eye on the levitation of Levantine fare. So what is the Levantine region? Well, consider the surrounding countries that uh, are around Israel, so Lebanon, Syria, uh, Jordan. So specialties from this area are uh, especially finding momentum in more of the trendy independent restaurants and on college and university campuses that are really a lot more progressive than a lot of uh, operations in the restaurant space. So we have labna, uh, tahini, and shug, and these are uh, ingredients and dressings. For example, uh, shug is a spicy ingredient, up more than 14% year over year. We're seeing that on top of bowl meals. We're seeing that on top of salads. Um, so really some innovative applications. Um, some of those superfoods and functional foods are coming out of this region as well, so they have strong tie-ins, not just to flavor, but also to health. So we see this movement around Israeli cuisines and the countries surrounding Israel as really gaining momentum too. So if we're talking about ethnic food, we have to mention Asian fare. And as we talk about Asian fare, the conversation has to keep evolving. So as I said, kind of trending away from those uh, Americanized versions of maybe Chinese and Japanese food. Those are pretty well entrenched on the menu. But now we're moving more toward, uh, we've made a movement toward Thai cuisine, toward Vietnamese ingredients as well. So that Southeast Asian regional cuisine has started to gain momentum. We're in the midst of that right now. So what's next? Well, we are moving more toward greater acceptance of the flavors of Korea and India. Uh, Technomic has talked a lot about Indian cuisine in particular. Um, that the, the time has come for Indian cuisine. We are seeing some fast casual restaurants that specialize in Indian fare really making their push right now. So this is something that is becoming uh, much more, uh, moving more to the forefront in the mind of, of the food service consumer. So keep an eye on Korean foods and flavors and Indian foods and flavors as well. But the next big trend that we are forecasting is going to signal the ascent of what we're calling Asian island cuisine and the foods and flavors of places like Malaysia and Singapore, the Philippines, and Indonesia. Again, you have consumers who are saying, I haven't tried that, but I'd like to. It really sounds good. So 57% of consumers say, I haven't tried Malaysian cuisine, I haven't tried Singaporean cuisine, but I'd like to. And about a half of consumers say the same about Philippine foods and Indonesian foods. So there appears to be, again, that strong level of interest in Asian island cuisine, and especially um, that will be interpreted usually with Asian street foods. So this looks like a good time for us to break again and hear again from our experts. And we'll start again with Chef Ryan. So Chef Ryan, what are the Middle Eastern and Asian flavors that you think will be most adaptable to the mainstream palate? Boy, I'll tell you, I have so many thoughts here. This information is so consistent with what we see sort of on the ground around requests and the development of these, these flavors. And, you know, I would say just sort of jumping out at, at, you know, what you covered, Middle Eastern and Asian are flavors that are so exciting for chefs to put on menus and correspondingly very exciting for consumers. So this is a rich area, and, and I think you're identifying Korea and India. It feels very, very consistent with, with that whole process. But, but let, me, let me get a little bit ahead of myself. I think consumers are absolutely ready for these foods, and I couldn't agree more with the, the assertion that it's no longer this generic sort of idea about something Asian or something Latin, right? It's really become much more specific in, in, in consumers' minds and therefore in, in, our, in our minds and chefs' minds. Chefs have been thinking about this thing for a long time. So when I think of Middle Eastern, for example, um, some of the foods that jump out at me is a spice called za'atar, right? 
Zatar is this spice mixture which has this uh, sort of slightly sour note. It, it includes uh, ingredients like sesame seeds and, um, and herbs like oregano. And it's very interesting topical application for things like fish, proteins, vegetables, other dishes as well. So zatar is something to look out for that I believe comes out of, uh, I want to think, Lebanon. And it's really interesting. Um, Stay in that Middle Eastern area, I think we would be, uh, you know, we have to recognize that hummus continues to be interesting to consumers, right? And I think we're moving away from hummus, right? We always talk about familiar with a twist, right? Well, that's still happening here, right? So obviously the hummus that are based on chickpeas and tahini, still consumers love them, but I'm seeing hummus move into other spaces. For example, we did a session recently here at Nestle where we produced this beautiful roasted carrot hummus made by one of the chefs here on our team. And it had the benefit of being this beautiful hummus alternative, again, using carrots, but it also served the ability to be a low-fat, high-flavor spread for sandwiches, which may be alternatives to things like mayonnaise. So I see that on the Middle Eastern side. I also see hummuses starting to be made with things like root vegetables, seeds, nuts, uh, legumes, as well as some of those other things that I mentioned a moment ago. So I definitely see there. And on the Asian side, boy, that's exciting too. And uh, obviously, interest in Asian food is going to continue. Um, and you called out Korea, and that was in one of my notes, right? Korean foods are just simply exciting to palates and exciting to chefs, right? We think of uh, things like gochujang, right, which is that chili paste used widely in Korea, which is awesome used in the making of sauces and braised dishes, stir fries, cold salads. So look, look at gochujang, uh, hard, to, uh, hard to pronounce, but delicious to taste as one of those items. Kimchi certainly fits the bill as an, as an item that has lots of uh, you know, tradition as a fermented ingredient and is very, very exciting to use in alternate preparations. Uh, are, are some of the things that jump out at me. And I would be remiss to not also call out Indian, but there's so much to cover here. Indian foods are so diverse and so exciting, and the simple ability to combine spices in a masterful way makes Indian food different than almost anything else. So I, I think you're right on track around these trends of Middle Eastern, Asian, specifically Korean, and Indian foods being very exciting, uh, on our on our radars right now. Sounds delicious just hearing you talk about all of it. Mm -hmm. um, Martin, wait, wait in here uh, for us as well. What global trends from other parts of the world are you seeing taking hold in the U.S. for beverages? Which ones are making a, an impact in the beverage uh, category, and are they different across industries? Um, excuse me. As I, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, aside from the purple potato drink, I'm, I mean, we're seeing uh, trends like mint lemonade very much coming from the Middle East, uh, where it's not just a combination of the citrus of lemonade, it's the addition of fresh mint. Um, cardamom milk, cardamom's a very strong spice, uh, Middle Eastern spice, which I'm sure Chef will agree with. So we're now seeing flavored milks with cardamom. Um, there's a product called Salet, which is... Uh, bit of a Turkish Iranian sort of uh, hot cocoa type beverage. Uh, the, the Middle East and certainly Asians do have a tendency towards a very sweet palate. So a lot of these are very sweet and uh, rich products. Uh, also the, the emergence of uh, hibiscus tea, uh, not just for the color, but also for the flavor. Um, aniseed is also a very popular flavor in the Middle East, aside from the, the well-known arak as the alcoholic distilled spirit. Um, you see um, aniseed flavors creeping into beverages a lot. So, again, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, really beverages that are complementing the, the food and dining experience. Some really interesting flavors mentioned there. Thank you both. So we'll delve into our next trend now. And over the past few years, Instagram and other photo sharing apps have revolutionized the food industry. We've seen food service operators even create food and beverage with social media in mind. So consumers use platforms like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram to communicate about everything from politics to pop culture, so food trends are no exception. So 
Social media is a huge tool for marketing and promoting flavors and new menu offerings, but it's still continuing to evolve. So here's what consumers think about the influence of social media. Overall, 30% of consumers say that restaurants and bars that post on social media are effective in prompting them to make a visit. And among younger adult consumers, that response is even higher. So this is data that comes from Technomics Adult Beverage Planning Program Survey. So this is really about not just food, but beverages too. 41% of millennials say that social media influences their visitation decision. So here's where social media really becomes a tool to drive traffic, to drive visitation, um, to really influence purchase decisions too. So in keeping with this theme of evolution, where do we stand on the evolution of social media? Well, we started out using social media as a crowdsourcing tool to obtain information that was trending from a large number of people spreading the word on the Internet. And in the food and beverage industry, we've also seen the Internet as this effective platform for business-to-business -business marketing and sharing of ideas among chefs and menu developers across different food service channels. You know, social media has been a platform to really provide that word of mouth on ideation, preparation trends, and insights among insiders. And then there's also, uh, you know, we're in the midst of this idea about social media as the platform for wow factor foods, right? So think back last year or so to the unicorn frappuccino from Starbucks and how huge the reaction to that colorful over-the-top beverage was. But it was an Instagram sensation more than anything else. It really took, over, uh, took off with younger consumers, but it, it never would have without social media. So that's how integral social media was to that big buzz that was created around that limited time offer. But now what we're seeing is that Instagram stories, things like Facebook Live, YouTube, they've extended the trend beyond just putting out a single snapshot or having a single conversation. They want food and beverages that play well through videos. So we have audio enhancements, right, such as popping candies. We saw a major chain put popping candies on top of pancakes to create this sensational mouthfeel and even the sound of the food, or items that move or alter in time, like color-changing cocktails, beer that glitters, uh, pizza topped with glitter. You know, all of these things just kind of delight diners, especially, again, those younger consumers. And because social media is evolving so quickly, we can expect menu trends to adapt in some really fun and funky ways. So here's a couple of examples. You know, if you paid attention to the Internet over the last, you know, over the holiday season, Duck's Eatery in New York City offered smoked watermelon ham. And this kind of plays into the whole plant-based trend as well. Here we have a fruit that is brined and smoked and treated just like a holiday ham would be, cut and prepared that way. This took off on social media. There were so many pictures in the internet, on the Internet about this smoked watermelon ham that was said to mimic a regular roasted pork ham. At True Laurel in San Francisco, the Spirit Sage Cocktail has butterfly pea flower infused gin. This is a color changing cocktail that glitters and glows. So again, something that has real impact on not just a picture on social media, but video on social media. And remember what our consumer said. These are the types of things that really drive their decision to visit a particular uh, food service destination. So we're going to ask Chef Ryan to weigh in right now about the influence of social media. You know, what's the implication, Chef Ryan, for operators across different channels, you know, going forward? What's the best strategy for introducing these kind of Instagram-worthy beverages and foods? So I think, you know, when, when the word Instagramable becomes a verb and it, it, it often influences how we have to think about how we promote ourselves as operators and, and how we promote food, we know we've come to a whole different place. So what I think is probably most critical is that the need to adapt. And I, I say that really in some ways for, for people like myself. I, I'm a young baby boomer. And, uh, you know, social media is not the most intuitive thing for me. But, but our ability to adapt to the needs of social media as a tool to promote our food, to promote our teams, to promote the products in our restaurants is, is, good, is here to stay and is going to be a part of the fabric uh, of our lives for, for some time to come. You know, so really I think a lot of it has to do with just 
how we act on that process to drive traffic to our customers. We think about, you know, it ha it's a visual medium, right? So the ability to post photos of your food offerings on social media sites are critical, right? Uh, high quality foods that lure you in, they cause you to stop and click on that photo are critical, right? Sharing videos of your chefs preparing food in an informal setting is very interesting and in some uh, things that can be done. Uh, ex for example, posting experimental dishes and asking your guests and your customers to sort of vote on which ones they'd like to see are some things that you might do for some interest. So I think there's, there's an ad adaption that's necessary to get to that place and a self-promotion that is really well within the control of, 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 of most, if not all, operators. And, and I want to tell a quick story about this process. We did a large project for a, um, one of our fast casual uh, chain customers in, uh, in, in last year in, in September. And um, it was around a product rollout that they wanted to have. And it was interesting. We, we put a pop-up restaurant in uh, lower Manhattan in New York City, just a space that was converted for a two-day period. And the most critical thing that caused that to be successful was there were social media influencers invited to that event. And at that event, as we served these delicious new products, to these social media influencers, they all took photographs of themselves with the product, with sometimes with crazy costumes on, and they then all subsequently posted those to their social media site to, and all their followers. And my understanding is that event generated something like two million unique media impressions around that product. So while not everyone could do that, those kinds of things and those kinds of promotions are things that operators can do to use social media to drive sales and to drive traffic to their to their operations. Right, definitely influential today. So we're going to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about operations, in particular how technology is affecting operations. And we're going to look at this from two angles, uh, third-party delivery, and high-tech delivery programs. So we'll quickly talk about the numbers behind the trend next. Um, Off-premise dining is claiming a larger share of occasions in sales. So as of 2018, we saw that 56% of restaurant sales are for on-premise occasions, while 44% of restaurant sales are for off-premise occasions. And that represents about 3% year-over-year growth. Now, third-party delivery within that niche represents a much smaller piece of the pie, but its growth over the past several years has been significant. 25% of all off-premise orders are now for delivery, and of that, there's been a 23% increase in customer spend for third-party delivery since 2017. Now, we're not just talking about Grubhub and Uber Eats and DoorDash partnering with restaurants. We're seeing retail food service really get behind this trend, too. So convenience stores, um, grocery stores that are really into food service, they're also partnering with these third-party delivery services to get food out to consumers uh, in a convenience-oriented way. So while it certainly represents a strong convenience positioning, you know, what impact is this having on the dining occasion? We're seeing at-home dining really flourish, but is it at the expense of the experience of dining out? Restaurants and other food service locations really want to fulfill a consumer demand and capitalize on the growth, but what will the lasting impact be? And while that is the larger question, the one question immediately in front of restaurants is how best to respond right now. So we're looking at these really tech-forward companies like Domino's, which is the delivery leader. They're not wasting any time. They have the capital to pioneer some really innovative delivery programs. So one operator example is Domino's. They have a new delivery solution called Domino's Hotspot. So they've installed hotspot signals in various locations around the country, 150,000 of them to be exact. And similar to a Wi-Fi hotspot, if you are in proximity to one of these hotspots, you can use your app to order Domino's and have it delivered wherever you are. So we hear a lot about delivery services competing for the last mile with customers. Well, this is more like the last block or the last few feet. Because with hotspot delivery, Domino's can meet up with customers at public parks, beaches, anywhere near the hotspot, and they have new delivery vehicles that are equipped with warming ovens so they can ensure that 
Through technology, their product is freshly cooked and hot once they reach the customer at that hot spot. So really innovative take there. So, um, you know, Martin, from a technology standpoint, what should operators be thinking about? Um, you know, they have to meet today's consumer demand for convenience, but what about experience and entertainment? What are some thoughts there around technology? Yeah, Amy, I, I think you used the important word there, which is around experience. Um, at the end of the day, you know, technology can only enable things. And if technology is just there for technology's sake, then unless it adds some level of convenience, some level of connectivity or choice um, and better quality, then it really isn't going to add any value to the customer or the consumer. Um, things that, you know, we've seen, you know, it's not just the, the touchless pay, uh, which is finally getting into, into the USA and has been in, in the UK and Europe for maybe eight, ten years. Uh, but you're seeing the rise of self-serve kiosks where there's, there's actually no staff. It really is just down to using uh, credit cards or, or, or uh, swipe cards from companies. Um, you're seeing a uh, pickup locker type uh, where, where Amazon leave packages. You're now seeing some restaurants uh, testing this concept where hot foods can be left for consumers to, to go and collect uh, items such as 3D printing. Uh, where you can personalize using 3D technology, not just on cafe uh, lattes and, and milky coffee products, but also on foods like pizzas and, and cakes. Um, but at the end of the day, as I said, it's got to be about an experience and it's got to add some value to the consumer rather than just being a cost for the sake of some, uh, some fancy piece of technology. Great. Thanks, Martin. So our final trend for today is what we're calling Humble Eats. And what does Humble Eats mean? Well, it kind of connects back to what Chef Ryan was saying about maybe foods that your grandmother had in her cabinet. We're talking about very simple, home-style, nostalgic types of comfort food. So everything from katsu sando, which, can, which is a Japanese comfort food of breaded pork cutlet, or schmaltz, which is a traditional, uh, an ingredient traditionally found in Jewish cooking. It's just rendered poultry fat, usually rendered chicken fat. How about fried bologna? If you're from the Midwest or the South or from Appalachian region, you may have grown up eating a fried bologna sandwich. We're even seeing jello in different desserts and cocktails. And wheat lacote, which is a Mexican delicacy of fermented uh, fungus of corn. So these are very, uh, very simple very, very humble foods, but they're being elevated in some interesting ways. So if we look at Wheat La Coche, for example, here it is at Hello Sailor in Cornelius, North Carolina. We've seen a, nearly a 12% increase in Wheat La Coche on the menu. It's paired here with sunchokes and caviar with schmaltz, as we talked about before. And these two are so new as trends. We don't even have data for them yet, but we keep on seeing porridge um, in different interpretation. So here it is topped with chicken, um, kind of being presented in the way that maybe polenta would be, and fried bologna, uh, that, that childhood sandwich. At the Turkey and the Wolf in New Orleans, it's topped with melted cheese, coleslaw, and potato chips. So keep looking for these simple comfort foods to really be elevated as we go forward. And what is this trend all about? Well, it's about making use of everything in the kitchen, basically, um, old and broken ingredients, nose to tail, so making total use of the animal, um, even using that rendered fat, um, root to stem, and fermentation and other pre pre preservation, I'm sorry, techniques, um, making use of everything in the kitchen and really being creative with that. Um, so if we look at here at uh, this cocktail, uh, the secondary color cocktail at Pacific Standard Time in Chicago, it's made with strawberry-infused vodka, but it also features leftover strawberry trimmings, strawberry tops, and even the leaves. Um, and this is really important, especially to a younger consumer. Uh, zero waste policies are really important. So on college campuses, 41% of college students believe waste reduction is a top initiative that food service operators should be implementing, not just on school campuses, but everywhere that they go and source food and drink. They are really looking for this mentality around, you know, not, put, not wasting anything, but putting everything to good use. So, Chef Ryan, what do you think? How do you see sort of these comfort foods being elevated and served across different industries? 
You know, comfort foods are so well named, right? They, um, they really bring us that comfort, right? They have that high dose of nostalgia. They remind us of the best times of our lives with people that we love. So this is an area that, that I would also feel never really is going to go away. Um, we definitely have seen chefs take these, you know, what you name humble foods, these comfort foods, and elevate them. And there were some good examples given. I, I do think it's important, however, that, that, that not too much experimentation take place with these comfort foods because I think the very nature of what brings people back to them time and time again is that there, there's a high degree of familiarity with those ingredients. So I think chefs are definitely free to experiment. But, but, but this may not be the area where extensive transformation would be beneficial. So my, my feeling that is that it tends to sort of, you know, stay close to the original, feel free to experiment to improve and to enhance, but stay close to the original uh, would be some comments on that. That's good advice. Thanks, Ryan, for that take on it. You know, we talk about innovation, but maybe sometimes it's more important to keep the familiar in the forefront. Great advice. So everyone, as we wrap up today, we're going to leave you with a few final thoughts. Um, you know, we covered a lot of ground today, but here are some really important takeaways. Just remember that today, functional equals healthy. So it's more about the benefits that food can provide and what food can help people do or help them achieve or enhance their state of well-being. Plant forward fare, look for increased uh, creativity in preparation and presentation of plant-based foods. Remember to be region specific for ethnic foods. So if you have an ingredient that hails from Israel, call it out as being Israeli. If you have an ingredient that is native to Korea, call it out as being Korean. Uh, consumers are ready for a deeper dive there. Social media is not just uh, a tool to showcase and promote with pictures. It's also a key traffic driver. Remember our consumer response. It really helps them decide where to visit for food and drink. And as Martin was telling us, technology should really enhance the experience. So um, not just about convenience, but how can we really connect to the occasion and make the experience valuable to the consumer. And finally, simple foods are having their moment. Um, Ryan was just telling us, you know, they really connect to nostalgia. They've had their moment before, but they're having another moment now. So keep an eye on those simple, uh, humble foods and look for ways to maybe enhance them or to really recall the things traditionally that make them special. So it looks like we have a few minutes left for questions. So Pat, I'm going to let you go ahead and lead us into Q&A. Thank you, Amy. That was terrific. So in the Q&A portion of today's webinar, um, you can ask Amy, Ryan, or Martin a question at any time using the Q&A widget on your screen. So we do have a question from one of the attendees. Since you were just talking about how healthy is now more about functionality, um, the attendee wanted to know who is driving the demand for these new healthy alternatives? Is it all ages? Um, what does Technomics find in that area? Um, well, as Technomic uh, recently did our study on healthy eating, we are finding that the demand for these new functional foods is really is really coming from the younger consumer. Um, when we talk about, for example, older baby boomers and matures, um, they're, they're more um, seeking out the healthier foods that fall in line with their doctor's guidelines. So, um, you know, they may be instructed to reduce salt or instructed to reduce sugar. And so that tends to be more of an older consumer's focus. Whereas a younger consumer is hearing more about functional benefits, they're the ones that are kind of driving that emerging definition of health forward. That's not to say that older consumers are not interested in functional foods. They definitely are. But the trend is being pushed forward by the younger Gen Z consumer, um, that early 20-something, and the millennial consumer as well. Well, thank you, Amy. Martin or Ryan, did you want to add anything to that question? No, that's my sense also. Uh, it feels uh, more of a younger consumer as well. That was my sense sort of empirically. So, no, don't have much to add. Okay, thanks. So this question um, could be for you, Ryan. Uh, can you provide how the new trends might impact hospital, patient, and cafeteria feeding? 
This attendee is from a children's hospital with a wide range of diets. Yeah, so um, I, I would be remiss to, to sort of say that that is a definite area of expertise for me. Um, so I want to be careful about that. Could, could, I hear the, could I hear the question again? How, how these trends would affect hospital dining? Is that what I understand the question is? Yes, hospital dining and hospital cafeteria dining. The, per the attendee is at a children's hospital. Yeah, so I mean, you know, again, without having, you know, a lot of expertise in this area, I would say I have to believe that the, the trend of plant-forward, plant-based dining it will certainly translate as it has a significant health benefit to consumers of any type. Um, I think some of these flavors that we talked about typically are flavors that are uh, that skew healthy. We talked about sort of vegetable-based dishes. We talked about spices, things that can add lots of flavor without adding uh, certainly fat or calories or be nutritionally off, um, I think are some of the things that I would consider uh, translatable to that area of our business. Great. Um, and Martin, maybe you can answer this question. Several of the attendees want to know where they can get the Nestle trend report that you mentioned. Mm. Sure. If, if you, um, if any of the, the listeners go on to our nestleprofessional.us website um, and uh, there's a, a ready reference there, um, click on that link. It'll ask you some very, very simple questions um, and it's uh, available to download free of charge. So please do, do go there and, and get some more information. Thank you. Um, there was a, a question about one of the items you mentioned, Amy, the fog crab cake. Is that something that's a product or is it, or is the operator making it from scratch? Um, I believe that the operator was preparing it there um, from scratch. Um, it was something that um, was developed um, at Indiana University's Dining Services Department. Um, yeah, so I believe it was a, it was a scratch made um, item that they were kind of showcasing and, and sampling out. Uh, may, I, may I add to that uh, a, a slight addition to that? Um, there was an item that we uh, tasted recently um, in uh, in a food show, which I thought was extremely fascinating. These this idea of protein analogs and that are vegetable based are, are things. That, that you know, many people have an interest in. The product that I'm talking about was, was, was when you looked at it, it looked exactly like red tuna, right? Like you might find on sashimi or sushi. And upon closer inspection, and it had a texture and taste very much like red, you know, red uh, tuna. Um, and um, when we asked about it, it was in fact made from 100% plum tomatoes that the skins have been removed, the seeds have been removed, and they were pressed together. And the, the, the result was a food that was vegetable-based, plum tomatoes, with, with really relatively neutral flavor. And, uh, and it was used as you might use raw tuna. And, uh, and I think that's another example of how manufacturers are beginning to produce products that have, that have great sort of ability to satisfy customers but move them away from um, uh, protein offerings if, if they choose to do that. Thank you. Uh, there's another question here for you, Chef Ryan. It's about authenticity. Do you feel that yeah. keeping the food traditional with international foods or ethnic foods is a trend now, or is fusion still something that's trending? So I, I would say, um, you know, fusion is an interesting word because I think that um, fusion can be done well. That is, and, and you've seen some examples, for example, on the West Coast where tacos and uh, Korean food were combined in a in very masterful way to make these exciting fusion of, of two very disparate things, right? So, so it, it certainly can work. I can also say that I've seen... Um, you know, food that where a chef attempted to to sort of do fusion, and, and it ended up being what I would have probably called cut fusion. So I think we need to be careful about that. Um, I, I hear less and less and less about fusion, and much more about this authenticity, right? So in some ways, fusion is sort of taking a backseat 
uh, in, I hear it less prominently. Um, ethnic and, and very specific ethnic has replaced fusion in my mind. Great. Um, another question we have is in calling out exotic ingredients, is that more important than uh, to highlight the exotic ingredients or the payoff on your menu? Yeah. Is that for me? It's for whoever so wants to take it. <laughs> sure. So I would add, I would add one piece there. Um, a few moments ago, I think Amy mentioned the word "wibla coche," um, which was that corn product that is uh, from Spain, highly prized corn product. I, I, I would say um, there's there's a caution with calling out certain ingredients, particularly difficult to pronounce ingredients. Um, because it, it, it may create a barrier that you may not want with your customer. So I, I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword and some education might be necessary. So if you're using an ingredient that is unusual or hard to pronounce, um, having staff members or team members there to help with that pronunciation, or maybe some point of sale materials, I think would be critical. But, but it definitely gives us that deep dive into authenticity, but there's a few cautions associated with it. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and this one's for Amy. So with the trend moving into holistic attributes, have you seen anything with neurogastronomy, neurogastronomy or DNA research? Hmm. You know, a colleague of mine um, that also works on these trends, um, mentioned something about it the other day. Now, I can't say that I've done a deep dive on that, um, but there is um, some movement around using DNA um, to establish, um, you know, uh, uh, what, what would be most beneficial for a person in the way that they eat or to answer some sort of, of uh, um, you know, need or remedy that they have according to their DNA uh, or according to their family history or something like that. There is something happening there uh, with personalized health. I think that's what uh, it's kind of being referred to. Um, can't say that I've done a deep dive on it or ha have any data on that, but we are definitely seeing some peaked interest in what we're calling personalized health. Terrific. Well, now we have to conclude the webinar. As a reminder, you'll receive an email when the on-demand recording of today's event is available. And on behalf of our sponsor, Nestle Professional, thank you all for joining us, and we hope you have a great day.